Welcome back, everybody. I think we are ready to begin. Um, as always, we'll uh, try to put a microphone in your hand if you have a question. It makes it a lot better for us from the standpoint of uh, recording if uh, you, you do use the mic. I'm not familiar at all with, uh, like, Bolivia. What kind of an education system do they have there in terms of educating their young children, you know, right on up? So you've got all these different kinds of indigenous groups. Uh, how does yeah. that play into the whole thing? Yeah, so a, a big part of that conversation is urban-rural discrepancies. Um, so what kind of an urban indigenous community would have access to in public education would be dramatically different than what that rural education would look like. And especially in Bolivia, those urban-rural divides in terms of poverty, inequality, job opportunities um, are dramatically different. Um, a lot of... So Evo is a really interesting story. And like, if you're interested in his education story, that would be easy to track down. So Evo Morales, who was elected and just stepped down. Um, so his, his family was originally um, tin miners, I believe. Don't quote me on the, he was a miner. I don't know if it was tin, I think it was tin. Um, and as the mines were privatized, um, the family lost their job, and then they moved into a, a different part of the region and started growing coca. Um, so a lot of his education came in that more rural area. And his political start was as the, the union organizer of the coca growers labor union. Um, so he talks a lot about his education. I think he went as far as high school, but also don't quote me on that. Um, but kind of different access to different types of education, depending on those urban rural divides. Um, in Chile, similar dynamics in terms of which students are able to access which quality of school, um, which ones are public, which ones are private, which ones have different types of intercultural education. So which which students are able to learn Mapuzungun or which ones learn exclusively Spanish, which students learn English, which provides a whole nother kind of opening of access to different types of education and career paths. Um, the, the protests in Chile right now have opened a really hard conversation about the entrance exam. So it's very correlated the quality of the school you went to with your score on an entrance exam, and that very much determines what universities you have access to and you know what career paths and opportunities in life you have access to. So in Chile, they open that conversation of how can we not have your access to university education and different careers be so dependent on the quality of the, the school that you had access to. But you know, access to good rural schools is still really hard, public transportation to get to and from is a challenge, so. What yeah. about the curriculum itself? Controversial. I mean, you know, we hear a lot of conversations in the US about how is slavery discussed, how are Native American communities discussed, where in the curriculum, like is it a separate chapter or is it integrated all the way through? Um, in, at least in Chile, I know more that a lot of those textbooks and curriculum are a lot more standardized. Um, I don't know if I would say that's necessarily a fabulous thing. You can probably tell from kind of my, my take on this that I wish they were much more proactive. I think similar conversations here in terms of education of like, are indig how, how is the relationship between the Spanish and the Mapuche community talked about, the relationship between the Chilean community and the Mapuche community. How do you talk about colonial, settler colonialism to the region in school textbooks? Um, you know, those are all still ongoing debates that, you know, I think every country can kind of go further in terms of how they're talking about those hard parts of our histories. What role does the Catholic Church play in any of these debates? Oh, interesting. Um, differently in different places. 
So some indigenous communities have better relationships with the Catholic Church, and it kind of served as a point of mobilizing. Sometimes the Catholic Church served very much the opposite purpose, um, you know, in, in terms of promoting a very particular way of thinking about indigeneity and religion. Um, but sometimes the Catholic Church some of the really powerful indigenous movements were kind of splintered off and started in some of the Catholic churches as kind of a point of mobilizing. Just, you know, a lot of communities, the Catholic church is really powerful and, a, you know, a social meeting place, um, a community meeting place. That conversation started and then kind of flowed into more, more active critiques of the government. Um, so it's complicated, different, different in different places. Um, but I think as a kind of as a community organize uh, as a mechanism of community organizing you know, churches are prominent and in some communities a powerful place to start a lot of these conversations um, I don't know about I mean here we've got so many different Indian uh, tribes Is it, I don't know if it's that way there and is there any way for those people to get together and try and do things together or are they and I don't know how the poverty levels are so low that they can't even do some of that or mm -hmm. how does that work I think I'm going to say it's complicated to every question you ask um, so uh, one thing that has been very challenging for a lot of countries is a lot of the mobilizing in the organization and the legislative change was prompted by the most powerful and the biggest indigenous communities in that country. So like, you know, in Bolivia, the Aymara and Quechua communities are, are the ones that kind of pushed a lot of the original activism, or um, not the activism, but the, the political power. Well, different demands. So it's a complicated political negotiation of what's good for, is what's good for one community good for another community. Um, in Bolivia, it's been interesting because there's kind of high land and low land geographically, and the demands of those different communities are, are very different. So like a lot of the extractivism is happening in the lowland regions, the parts that's really close to Paraguay and Brazil, really fertile, powerful, profitable land. Um, so what those communities are looking for is very different than the highland communities who are a lot more urban. Um, you know, the, the trajectories have been very different. And a lot of, um, there were a lot of critiques by indigenous communities of Evo for favoring some demands of some communities over others um, as he kind of played out his policy platforms. In Chile, the Mapuche community is about 85% of the indigenous community in Chile. And so a lot of what's written in the law that I talked about is motivated by their demands because there was a lot more political sway that they were able to hold. Um, some of the, I did some really interesting interviews with the communities in the South that lived in the canals at you know the bottom of, of Chile and Argentina, and they were demanding land even though ancestrally they didn't have relationships with land because they were you know, in the canals and traveling by boats. Um, but because the law has set up this procedure through which indigenous communities can access land, they now are trying to kind of take advantage of that law saying, and the, you know, there's some fascinating banners where they say, we're also indigenous, we also want to work through this policy, we want our land demands. Um, so I think it's a concerning example of kind of how what the government does structures how indigenous communities articulate their demands and is it what is the demand that they're looking for? Does the policy map onto that demand? How are you kind of reinventing indigenous identity by the by the policy that you're creating is complicated. And of course, who are the leaders? you know, some leaders from some communities are going to be more powerful and have more people and have more political capital, more social capital, more economic capital to push through more changes. And other communities won't have that same, that same amount. Uh, I have a question about the comparison between Peru and Bolivia. Oh, yes. Is that better? Yep, perfect. The comparison between 
Bolivians, Peruvians, and Chileans. What is there a, a big difference between the people that live there that are native to those countries? Yeah. Um, so you know, Peru, you know, is kind of center of the Incan Empire, but it's important to keep in mind that the Incan Empire was an empire that conquered lots of indigenous communities that were around it before the Incan Empire kind of coalesced. So it was very expansionist. Um, it, the Incan Empire got down to where the Mapuche community was, but the Mapuche community was never conquered. It was the only community not to be conquered by the Incan Empire that, as the Incan Empire kind of expanded. Um, so, I mean, I think, think of it in terms of layers of different different communities with different governing structures that kind of start to interact with each other. So like in Bolivia and Peru, there's a lot of communities that, that had kind of a, a family based communal kinship structure that then were incorporated into the Incan empire, then were incorporated into Peru or Bolivia. Um, and now are interacting with the policies that Peru and Bolivia have. Um, yeah. So think kind of layers of, layers of governing structures on top of different communities that were there pre, even pre-Incan Empire. Does the Inca Trail still exist? Yeah, yeah. Um, I hiked on it once in Chile. It's fascinating. It, um, you know, because it was communication lines. So, you know, they needed those lines of communication to be able to communicate from one point in the empire to the other and they had runners and yeah, you can still, those, a lot of those trails are still hiking trails today. I have two questions for you. The first one is why is the indigenous per, uh, percentage so great in Bolivia where it's over 50% and Guatemala, it's like over 40%. Okay. The second question is over time, civilization has conquered different, you know, that, that was the name of the game. You go out and conquered somebody, and all of a sudden, then that's their land. Mm -hmm. So then somebody else comes in and conquers it and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, you look at uh, the generations of land ownership uh, through time, you know, and, and my question is, how, how can you revert back to the original owners of land when it's changed hands many, many times through civilization. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it just baffles me how you can go back and say, well, for the last 2,000 years, that doesn't matter. We're going back and these indigenous people should get this land. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't think there is an answer, but people that think it should go back to those folks. I, I, I don't quite understand. Yeah. Um, so first of all, in terms of the percentages, so all of those numbers are people self-identifying as indigenous. So it's actually really fascinating to watch swings in those numbers. So the one that was up there in Bolivia was in the 60s. Currently, it's about 45%, I think, of the population is identifying as indigenous. I think because of how critical they are of the AVO presidency. Um, so people are going to self-identify as different things at different points in time. Um, the same thing happened in Chile. Like for when I started this 10 some years ago, I think it was people said that 6% of Chile was indigenous. And in the, the 2010 census, about 10% of people said they were indigenous. Um, so, you know, people coming to terms with what their, what their ancestry is in different ways at different times in relationship with politics in different ways, um, you know, our identities are malleable and, and shift based on what's accepted and not accepted at certain points in time. So, so yeah, some of those number, I mean, it, it's a, it's a very complicated question of who who is indigenous and who identifies as indigenous. And you can see in the census numbers that some of those complications. Um, the, in terms, remind me two words of the second question. Oh, land, land. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think very, it's a very radical demand if a community says we want exactly 
what we had 2000 years ago. Um, I think most communities know that that isn't the way this conversation is going to happen, which is why a lot of the conversations are more in terms of self-determination and degrees of autonomy. Um, so rather than saying, you know, we're going to, we are going to live as if this was 2000 years ago, they're saying, how can we, you know, how can the state recognize the historic injustices that have been done and think about patterns of governance that will take steps away from that? Um, so a lot of, a lot of the conversation about returning land is t thinking about restoring some of those injustices. Um, but the point is, somebody owns it. Yeah. And they paid money for it. Yeah. So how do you come in and say, voila? Now yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's a good question. So in Chile, all of those all of those dots were government money paid to willing sellers of that land. Um, so, you know, that's another question of like, you know, indigenous communities can get land if the current owner is willing to sell it, but not if the current owner is not willing to sell it. You know, that's a complicated question, but in that case, it is buyer willing, seller willing with government money. Um, and that's been controversial because, you know, a lot of this land doesn't have a lot of buyers. Um, and if so, if the government is saying we'll pay you market price, that's more than they might have gotten had they opened it up, not having the government as as the buyer. Um, so Chile hasn't done expropriation. Other countries have. Um, and obviously, if that's the mechanism, that gets controversial. Um, for reasons, it gets controversial in the US. So but yeah, but some of them have been compensated by, with government money. Question here. Oh, yes. Um, I was interested when you were talking about, I think it was in the Constitution, of the, the thinking of um, uh, group rights as opposed to the individual rights first. And I wondered in about, uh, with um, talking about indigenous populations, if the culture affected that with indigenous cultures being more community-minded community than, say, our culture here in the United States, um, the predominant culture of like individuals first. I just mm -hmm. wondered if that was involved in that um, at all. Yeah, I th so I mean, I think it's both. Um, I think first of all, I think, I don't know if I would say our culture is individualistic. I think we have become that, but like, to, to pinpoint what a culture is is really complicated, um, you know, because there's lots of layers of things that happen and change over time. Um, you know, I, would we say we were individualistic 200 years ago? I don't know. Like, I, I think cultures kind of adapt and weave and, and change. Um, in terms of indigenous rights, there's been a big focus on saying that these are both collective and individual. Um, so there's been a big push to talk about like, so I was telling someone in the break that about 50% of the Mapuche community lives in Santiago, does not live, does not live in a community, does not live on ancestral land. Um, so a lot of these conversations are saying those rights also apply to that individual regardless of quote unquote what we expect that community to look like or what that community did look like at any point in time. So it's kind of saying, you know, we know we know there are these inequalities in development, in access to education, in experiences with citizenship, and that's both individual and collective. Um, so lots of people in the 50s and 60s in Chile moved up to the capital and the the government, not the government, but the, the UN has been very clear in saying this conversation about indigenous rights applies to both both the community and the individual that left the community at whatever whatever point in time. Um, so both. Uh, yeah, um, the last couple of questions kind of touch on this. The question of how people identify as indigenous. And I wonder, in these various places, how much do you observe the practice of adjusting their costume, their language, their music, 
and using that as part of their identification. Mm -hmm. Any place in particular? Well, I was thinking of just, just the other day, I saw that the uh, Maya in, uh, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Mexico were using the, the Maya numer numeral system, which is based mm -hmm. on a base 20. Mm -hmm. They were teaching children in school, and it was p part of a revival of using the costumes as well. Yeah. Yeah, there has been... There has been a big push. I mean, that was kind of the the big impetus in the 80s and 90s to think a lot about revitalizing cultural traditions, revitalizing language, um, lots of push for intercultural medicine and thinking about how can you kind of do Western medicine and indigenous me medicine at the same time with plants from that region and so on. Um, I mean, I think how people, the extent to which people choose to engage with that varies a lot. Like, in, go ahead. Just to follow up, um, how about the Mapuche? And you said that a lot of them were urban. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see some of this with Mapuche? Yes, in different places at different times. Um, a lot of um, at a lot of public events, you'll see men and women wearing traditional clothes very openly. There are parts of the city where it's not surprising to see it. And then there are also small things that you can see people kind of use to self-identify, like particular symbols on a necklace or on a bracelet or a tattoo they might have. Um, so yeah, people kind of self-identify in different ways in terms of how they appear, how they appear. And in different places at different times, like you don't, you don't see it as much in Santiago as you do in the South where communities have a much bigger presence and um, people expect it more. Um, you know, it stands out in different places at different times and people strategically choose how much they, they want to present that. Question here. I was going to ask what countries in the Western Hemisphere had signed the 2007 UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights, but what you just said about the UN almost being directive to Chile about rural and urban surprises me because I can't think that the UN ever took such a directive approach to the US to on indigenous rights. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Well, so the UN does periodic reviews of lots of countries on lots of things, um, and indigenous rights are part of that. It's also a bigger part of the conversation in Chile because there's been some of these allegations of terrorism. There have been um, there have been people claiming that they're political prisoners. So you know the the activists have called some attention. Some of it also comes not from the UN, but like from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So there've been some really famous cases of activists against the Chilean state that have been argued in that Inter-American Court. Um, so it's kind of a multi-layered, um, the UN isn't taking an overly active interest, but they do do these periodic reports where they kind of call attention to patterns that they're observing, especially in terms of criminalization, in terms of participation levels, inequalities, et cetera. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, so like the US embassy in Chile looks into this, especially when there are allegations of terrorism. Um, so when I was down there, some embassy officials wanted to talk with me about what are your impressions of these allegations and who should we be talking to? And so the, the publicity of some of the events attracts more attention and that kind of works up through bureaucratic levels of, of the UN in different ways. But I would say the UN mostly in terms of those, of those um, the, the periodic reports that they do on different rights. Um, and then special reporters, special envoys from the UN going when there's a particularly controversial event. What are the particular issues of autonomy in uh, the two nations that you talked about tonight? What, what, what kinds of decisions do these communities want to be able to make that they can't now? 
And what kind of decisions do they not care whether they have autonomy of that? Hmm. So in places where extractivism is a big conversation, they're looking for free, informed, and prior consent of what that development project looks like. So in conversation with the corporation, in conversation with the country, if the country is supporting that development in some way, um, a lot is on self-governance. So how can, what's that local, most local level of governance and who... And how are those people elected and what decisions are they allowed to make? So in a lot of ways, decentralization has been a huge part of this conversation. Um, and I think sometimes in the U.S. we take for granted the kind of the federal system and the layers that and the separation of powers that we have between different parts of government. Um, and that's a lot of what the conversation is of what are what are the rights that are reserved for that local government to make and so a lot of communities want that decision-making power to be closer at the same time with funding, right? Um, so, you know, if, if they can run their own government but have no budget and have no right to the taxes that are collected in that region, no right to the profits of the corporation that's operating in that region. Um, so a lot, of it's which, a lot of it's which rights are that communities or that governments, that local municipality, what are they able to make and how much money is associated with, with those decisions? Uh, thanks for being here tonight, Kelly. We appreciate it. Um, I have two questions. The first one's sort of demographic. You identified in the map uh, the two countries, Guatemala and uh, Bolivia, very high percentage and accepting that people are a little variable in how they self-define. They're really an order of magnitude, almost yeah. different from the other countries. Um, are those numbers really indicative of why Bolivia has really uh, proliferated in some attempts? Is there a demographic? Hmm. And if so, why, why hasn't Guatemala in the same way? Because the self-identification is really strong hmm. in all those cultural forms that the other gentleman mm -hmm. was asking about. Uh, and I'll hold the other question. Okay. Interesting. I mean, one of my one of my first thoughts, and then I contradicted myself as I thought through it, was, um, you know, so the the Quechua and Aymara community in Bolivia are are in the highlands in the capital. Um, so that's a very powerful, like just in terms of geography, they're very close to the centers of political power, mobilizing. It's a more urban community, so that access and that political leverage is easier, whereas you know, in, in Guatemala, more highland communities, more disconnected from kind of the sources of political power, just in terms of geography. Um, but then I contradict myself because in, in Bolivia, a lot of the initial mobilizing were lowlands communities that marched to the capital, um, you know, did like a 30 day march to protest government extraction, protest lack of rights, lack of access to opportunities. Um, I, I think I don't that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I I mean I guess the, my, my other initial thought about Guatemala is just the the longer legacy of the Civil War and what that transitional justice period and the later time period. Um, so like Ecuador and Bolivia were very much at the forefront of those UN conversations in the 80s because of the nature of the political histories of the countries at the time. And there was space for that mobilization to gain power and momentum in the early 90s in Bolivia. Um, and I think, you know, Guatemala in the early 90s was was at a very different point in their, their political history. So some yeah, guesses. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, uh, stimulated by the other question over here, could you talk a little bit about the difference between uh, land titles and, and possession in a land tenure sense and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it sounds as though Chile's gone down the path of purchasing land titles in yes. order to grant sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, but sovereignty can exist even if all the land titles haven't been transferred. And I'm not sure that that difference yeah. is clear. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a big difference and I try and be careful with the language, but the difference between territorial rights and land rights. So land rights are very much what we're familiar with in the U S in terms of a property title that you can, 
use to as value that you can use from a bank to get to get loans and so on. Um, territorial rights are much broader in terms of recognizing the community's ancestral relationship with that section of land and recognizing more of that, that it's a social, political, economic relationship that that community has with a particular space. Um, one of the key conversations has been like subsoil rights and air rights. Um, Cause if we think about a land title that doesn't say a whole lot in terms of subsoil rights or if there's water going through um, or if there's an airport next door who you know has lots of air contamination that would affect that community. So, and territorial rights go a lot further in terms of thinking more holistically about, you know, what is a community having access to that space look like? So I guess I, th I think the, the subsoil rights and that looks different in different places for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, like fracking conversations come up. Does, a, does an, indig if an indigenous community has a land right or some sort of territorial recognition? Can the government permit fracking if subsoil rights in the in the country are determined different than that land title. So it's a long winded way to say it's complicated. <laughs> yes, I, I was curious, was the um, Chilean constitution they're trying to change, is that the Pinochet constitution? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, 1980. So that's the one we helped we help write, right? Yes. Buchanan and those guys. Okay. The second the second question I had was in terms of extraction, it, it, it's kind of interesting to me that um, we, the, with the neoliberal template that's basically been kind of imposed on all of Latin America, that really these economies don't have much choice but to ex extract if they're going to get any kind of revenue to do anything. So mm -hmm. it kind of puts them in a, in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. Because... You know, open markets that we, you know, sounds great here. It sounds like free open markets. We don't understand that their economies can't develop because they can't compete. And then uh, they remain in the same place that they always are. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I mean, neoliberalism, usually we think about limited government involvement, but it's it's interesting to think about the extent to which neoliberalism is kind of infused into the governing structures and the power that that has to structure the market. So like in Chile, one of the huge conversations are for the, if and how the new constitution will be written are water rights. Um, you know, I think neoliberalism was very embedded in how the Chilean constitution talks about water rights and thinking about, you know, how can, how can Chile a little more responsibly develop in a way that isn't as extractive and problematic for some of the small landowners that aren't able to get access to the water rights that the larger corporations are? Um, you know, how can the constitution kind of intervene in small ways to facilitate the market in different ways? Um, so I think it's tweaks in terms of how the government is set up and for who. And you know, if, if, the, if the state is set up to facilitate the market, that's very challenging for a lot of people. Um, so, I mean, I don't think the direction that Chile will go in is to undo engagement with the market I don't in any way. But I think it's small tweaks in terms of how can we ensure that this small landowner who doesn't have water rights is able to acquire some water rights so that they are also able to engage with the market. So I think it's kind of a, how can we expand the scope of the market rather than engage or not engage with the market? Like which people are able to access that? Early in the evening, you said that uh, the people in Chile really didn't see any difference between the Pinochet. Their Some of the Mapuche individuals, yeah. The okay. Mm -hmm. So is it because they don't experience much, or there hasn't been any change really in government support or intrusion? Is that the reason they don't see mm -hmm. any difference? Yeah, so like some of those pictures where you could see the police and the communities, um, a lot of Mapuche individuals will say, you know, our rights weren't protected during the dictatorship, and we, our community is being occupied on a regular basis. 
So, you know, they're like, what's, what's the difference? Our rights aren't recognized. Like, yes, formally we are living in a democracy, but if the community's rights aren't recognized, the experience, regardless of what the formal kind of central level of government is doing, it plays out the same at, the, at, a, at a local level and at a very rural level a lot of times. Um, that rural experience for a lot of people um, you know, looks like some of those images, unfortunately. And so they're knowing how to engage with public transportation in different ways, knowing how to predict and communicate with people about when police are going to be in certain places at certain times and how can you avoid the police presence and you know, if, the, if, if you're someone that the police thinks are involved with things, how do you have those networks of communication to ensure that you're not somewhere at a time you don't want to be? Um, so, and for a lot of people, that hasn't changed much. For some people, it has, but, you know, it always struck me, people saying, you know, Pinochet, the current president, Pineda, our, our daily life looks the same. Some people, not all. I'd, li I'd like to propose a, con or a solution, and then you comment on that solution. Kay. George Carlin, uh, years ago, did a little uh, comedy thing where he says, you're talking to someone, and all of a sudden you say to, to yourself, this person's stupid, or this person's ignorant, or, you know, he goes into a lot more than that, of course, but, you know, it seems to me in all these conversations we're having, we almost always look at the other person and go, is this person a reasonable person? Right? That's the first thing. It's not whether they're talking about God or about water rights or anything. It's always, is this person a reasonable person? Hmm. So I think the solution is to find reasonable people and let them talk. Mm -hmm. You brought up the term earlier about uh, conversation. I don't really see any conversations going on here. Hmm. Uh, what uh, a nonprofit group or someone, an advocate for this, could possibly do is say we're looking for, let's say there's three basic uh, group views. We need seven from each one, around 20, okay, that will commit to a year of understanding each other, not reaching any, you know, political agreements, just to understand each other. We don't mm -hmm. get anything done unless we get past the confusion of not even knowing what we're really trying to accomplish, right? And everybody's interests are so different. You know, we have a jury system that says 12 people can somehow or another, it's kind of amazing, can actually come up with an agreement on anything, and they do it, right? So what I'm saying here is I think it would be interesting if uh, you, you just put it out there that anybody who wants to commit that are reasonable people, they come and commit for a year mm -hmm. of getting to know each other, creating friendships and understanding, and mm -hmm. then build those you know, uh, at that level. Mm -hmm. And then that then, of course, the, the leaven will leaven the whole loaf, mm -hmm. ho ho hopefully. Yeah. I think there's tons of potential for that. Um, I think two things that I would point to is one, media coverage. So I think if you can get two people in a room, fabulous things can happen. But how do you get those people in that room without walking in with lots of prejudicial expectations of, of those people? Um, one of the things that I, I have in my book is uh, one of the main newspapers, how do they cover Mapuche communities? And they almost exclusively cover the violence. So, you know, someone who's living in the capital who doesn't know anyone in the South, you know, they're, are they going to go to that room if all they see in the newspaper are these instances of violence and demands that they don't see as possible? So I think one is kind of how do you, how do you make sure that people are curious and have access to the information they need to decide if they're part of that conversation. Um, and I think the other thing I would say, lots of indigenous activists are get very tired of dialogue because um, they say, you know, they say we've been doing this for 500 years and nothing's happened. So why why should I continue to not go to my job and not make money and not support my family when I've seen some people in my family commit to a similar process. So like in the transition to democracy in 89, a lot of Mapuche activists made an agreement with the incoming president that led to that 94 law that I showed. And a lot of activists radicalized because the agreement didn't match what they had agreed to. 
you know, so they said, I put all this time into dialogue with the incoming Elwin president in 89. They signed an agreement. You know, it's all formalized what that law would look like. And the law doesn't look like that. Um, so a lot of those leaders who were political leaders and were really committed to dialogue got really frustrated by the lack of results and kind of the, that president going back on what, on what he had promised through dialogue. But at the end of the day, yes. But I think kind of how can, we, how can we most responsibly get those people in the room ready to have that conversation and ready to follow through on how that conversation goes? Kelly, the witching hour has arrived. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you obviously, all. Obviously, there may be other things. <laughs>